Hey everybody, I'm Kasper and I'm focused on platform engineering for quite, quite a while now. I've seen dozens of setups across the European Union and the United States and I've been helping enterprises across these regions to, uh, to plan out their platform journey successfully. During this time, I've seen a tremendous amount of traps people fall into. And I thought here at PlatformCon 2022, I give a talk about the top 10 fallacies that I see in platform engineering. If you have ideas or comments, please feel free to reach out to me through my Twitter account or better directly via email. And I'm always happy to chat. Now with that, let's get started. Before I actually want to get into the main topic, I briefly want to set the scene and talk about what I understand if we talk about platforming and internal developer platforms. And then again, I want to be speaking about the top 10 fallacies that I see in that space and how we can mitigate them. Now, let's get started. To frame the problem, if you look at the complexity of the applications that we operate now in comparison to where we were 10 years ago, the average architecture of a modern cloud native application consists out of 25 times more components than its equivalent 10 years ago. We have five times more specialized tools in the tool chain to actually meet that scale and our scale is much, much larger. Many of you are serving thousands and hundreds of thousands of users all across the world. And that means many systems, many clouds, redundancy and high scale and volume. There's a lot of pressure on us to deliver. Things get more and more complex. And the reality is that teams waste a vast amount of their time operating apps as that complexity increases. The response that we have as an industry is that we're trying to control all of that chaos really through manual work and scripts. You have all of these components of your tool chain, you have all of these services, you have all of these dependent resources, and because not one individual is able to deal with all of that, it means you're introducing dependencies in your teams, developers wait, and operations drowns. This is why we're building platforms. But the why differs whom you ask. You have the user persona of the application developer and you have the user persona of the platform or SRE team. For the application developers, they really want to reduce cognitive load they want to um, be faster in self-serving things, so they have reduced waiting times. But they also don't want to be in a situation where you just shift things left and the, they are left with actually doing the heavy lifting. That means they have to have um, self-service opportunities with a reduction in cognitive load they also don't want to be abstracted away from the context, otherwise you have a platform as a service. And it's very important to them that it doesn't break the workflow. That is a lot of things you have to put under one umbrella to serve them well. And then you have the platform and SRE team. They want to standardize, they want to make things easier to maintain. They want to reduce the ticket ops tasks that they are confronted with today. And they want to focus on the things that actually matter rather than debugging dozens of deployments. Now, if you ask me what is an internal developer platform? Well, that is what a platform engineering team actually builds. It's the sum of many components that form a golden path for developers. There isn't the one tool that is an internal developer platform, because if there would be the one tool that would be an IDP, that is actually a pass. In that case, you can use Heroku. No, an internal developer platform, again, is the sum of many components that are crafted and put together by the platform engineering team into a reliable golden path for developers if we follow the Netflix wording, a paved road. All right, now you're starting your platforming journey. You're platforming the digital world. And as you do so, I can see many of you run into so specific fallacies over and over again. Let's go through the most common ones that I see. Number one by far is the prioritization fallacy. When I ask teams, hey, you're starting to platform, what are you starting with? The usual answers are, 
We are going to make it really simple to spin up a microservice and we are going to make it very simple to onboard a new user. And that sounds intuitive, right? Because in the end, that's the first thing you do in the application lifecycle or when you're a new developer at a firm. And now, no doubt, these things are very important. But are they the most important thing? Is that the best thing to focus on? Does that actually give you an ROI, a return on investment on all the hard work that you're putting into the platform? Or can you just use GitHub templates or maybe a clever script that you execute to onboard your uh, developers? Do you really need to build a very complex portal with a custom UI? Is that moving the needle? Well, I'm giving you that example because sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. It's really depending on the specific needs of your organization. I think what I'm advocating for is take a step back and actually try to figure out what moves the needle and then build things that really solve nasty problems that cost your colleagues a lot of time on a daily basis. A good exercise that I recommend is to actually get together with your colleagues and tell them, well, imagine 100 deployments how often do you do things that go beyond the simple update of an image? Assuming that the git push image update stream is figured out. And you'll be surprised what you will see. You can build a list like the one that I'm showing you right now where you say different procedures. How often do you do them? Let's brainstorm all procedures. Then let's say against 100 deployments. How often do we do these procedures? How much waiting time and how much effort does that include for developers? How much for operations? And then you sum that up. You have your prioritization list right there. Beware of the prioritization fallacy. Now, second, the visualization fallacy. Many people believe that just by visualizing something, things get magically better. There's a beautiful article that I recommend reading from Lee, who wrote... Um, an article with the title, if you put a pane of glass on a pile of shit, all you see is a pile of shit. And there is a lot of truth in that. Fancy dashboards and beautiful UIs don't have to move the needle. Again, they can, but they don't have to. Go beyond the more obvious things. And maybe what you actually need is a CLI to give you some security vetted S3 bucket. Maybe what you actually need is to focus on configuration management and build good baseline charts. The most obvious thing doesn't need to be the one that actually makes sense. Number three, the wars you cannot win fallacy. I see many platform engineering teams saying, oh, the first thing that we are going to do is we're going to clean up and we are going to take Jenkins away and we're going to move everything into Azure DevOps. Well, a lot of your teams have worked with Jenkins for a lot of time and it might not be the perfect product, but it, all of the pipelines are there, all of the tests are written and it's doing the job. Are you sure you are making a material change by now doing a lot of change requests to something that is a little better, but also maybe not that much? So beware of the wars you cannot win fallacy. People do not like to have things that work taken away from them. Number four, the everything and everybody at once fallacy. I see many platform teams saying, hey, we're building a platform that spends VM to Lambda, to give you a, a picture. And um, then we are going to take this thing we've built and we're going to roll that out to one and a half thousand developers. Well, guess what? That will be really hard. If there would be, like there isn't even a vendor out there who can give you that span, it's very unlikely to assume that you internally with the resources you have will be able to actually pull something off that's 10x better than what the developers have right now. Start very small. Agree on the longest, lowest common denominator tech stack. Build a golden path that works really well and then support that path, over-invest in that path. Don't do everything at once. And that also ties into the new setup isn't better fallacy. If you built a platform, but the platform is worse or equal to what the developers have been using before, nobody will adopt your product. That's the bitter truth. That's why 
Build something small that's 10x better. Number six, the abstraction fallacy. And I thought we would be over that 10 years ago, but apparently we're not. Abstracting developers is something where you lose their trust immediately. You have to design platforms that abstract, but without taking away the context. Observability is key. Being able to see everything as code is key. The, I like to compare platforms to uh, natural language processing algorithms. If you use a Siri or an Alexa and they would work in 95% of cases, but they would fail you in 5% of cases, it's the human nature to believe that these things don't work. You have to build paths that don't have to work in 100% of cases, but in the 5% of cases, the edge cases where it doesn't work, the team has to be able to go off the beaten path, do things themselves, and at any point in time, they need all of the context, what's happening under the hood. Number seven, the loudest voice fallacy. Many teams actually go that step where they treat their platform as a product and they sit down with their colleagues and say, hey, how do you want your platform? How should our future platform look like? And they will have um, all of their developers in a room and then there will be a couple of senior developers that are very well versed with Terraform and they love Crossplane and they there is this you name it, fancy new CNCF sandboxing pro uh, project, and they feel super comfortable with a lot of ambiguity and they want to make sure that there is nothing that they're restricted with and they are very outspoken. Now, these people will have a very loud voice and they will intimidate almost everybody else. In no engineering organization or in very few engineering organizations, um, a junior would get, get up to and say, hey, this is great that it works for you, but this is overwhelming for me. This is too much cognitive load. It's your job to treat your platform as a product. It is your job to actually get out there and do user feedback with as little bias as possible. And that means beware of the loudest voice. Make sure you talk to them because you have to win them over as well, but also speak with the average user in isolation, make sure you're really listening to how they want the setup to work. Good platforms are actually designed for the weakest link in the chain, not for the strongest. The freedom fallacy is number eight. There is a misconception in the industry that you have to give everybody every freedom. And if I speak about freedom, I speak about not everybody has to be able to introduce anything at any point in time. I am a huge advocate of agreeing on a lowest common denominator tech stack and then making that tech stack the one that's actually supported by the platform engineering team. That means you're reducing freedom by design. But if you do it carefully and you have a conversation and you abstract without taking the context and you leave the freedom to go off the beaten path, which means that the people that do that are on pager duty for just that. If you design it that way, there is nothing wrong with building a platform that also takes away a little bit of freedom. Number nine is the Google, Facebook, Netflix fallacy. A lot of engineers at these companies with tremendous budgets have been very vocal on how amazing their platform setups are and what you should do and what you should not do and how something works at Netflix. Now, Netflix is a great engineering organization, do not get me wrong. But the reality for the vast majority of organizations that I work with, the silent 99%, as I like to call them, is that they do not have the budgets and they do not have the management backing to actually invest so much time and resources in these platforms. So just taking the blueprints that you learn from these companies and trying to apply them one-on-one -on -one will almost certainly fail, which is also the reason why I am not a fanatic fan of taking products that are developed at these um, larger tech companies, and open sourcing them, half of them, and then believing um, that everybody can adopt them and actually see an ROI from that. And the last one is don't compete with 
Amazon Web Services. If there is a product by a vendor that has dozens of um, principal engineers on the topic, bashing things out, building things, well, then you should probably not compete with them. Because chances are that you will not be able to pour that much attention and focus into that specific product. Do not compete with uh, AWS. Now, thank you so much for listening in. Thank you for being part of PlatformCon 2020. I hope I gave you a couple of insights that are helpful for your platforming journey. Don't forget to debate in the PlatformCon Slack with me using the channel Platform Design. I'm very much looking forward to seeing you there.